Uh, the purpose of uh, today's presentation is uh, for those who uh, do not know well about what we are doing. Yeah, and uh, I thought that the uh, it's obvious that NMR structure determination take a lot of advantage from uh, the field of uh, distance geometry, and therefore I didn't mention that in the title. I simply mentioned uh, we will do uh, NMR structure determination, and uh, actually for us. Uh, structure is uh, just the starting point. Of course, it's a very important uh, middle point, but uh, uh, we actually usually will move on and try to uh, understand other aspects of the uh, biomolecules, including uh, the binding and also the, the function of these biomolecules. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, this is the, the our building uh, which is called the uh, Interdisciplinary Research Building for Science and uh, Technology. Uh, in the basement, we have a so-called car EM uh, machine, which can help us to determine the, the structure of very big biomolecules. And since uh, November last year, I was appointed to become the, uh, the building director of uh, um, this one, Biomedical Translation Research Center uh, this is inside our National Biotechnology Research Park. Not far from this building is uh, uh, something like uh, 30 meter away from uh, my original building. And then you can count this park. So, and it's uh, inside a very nice natural environment surrounded by a huge green area. So you are very welcome to come here uh, to visit us in Taiwan. And here we are trying to use uh, several kinds of uh, biotechnologies uh, to help develop uh, different kinds of drugs. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, from NMR structure determination to statistical mechanics of binding free age evaluation. Okay. Uh, actually, the subject the biomolecule subject I will talk about today is quite focused. Uh, I, I start with this slide. I hope that you will feel more interested. I think you can easily recognize where this is. This is a so-called Easter Island. Yeah? It's uh, inside the Pacific Ocean. You can see uh, on the uh, right bottom and uh, something like uh, 3,000 kilometer from uh, west from uh, Chile. And uh, there was a compound, it's a macro, macro lead called rapamycin. As you can see from this paper published in uh, 1975, actually this compound was uh, discovered slightly earlier. So this article published in uh, 1975 was a kind of review, I would say. It was, a, uh, actually the compound was uh, discovered, I think around 1972. Um, originally, they screened uh, the soil from this island and they found this kind of uh, bacteria, which is called Streptomyces uh, hygroscopius. And this kind of uh, bacteria actually uh, has some antifungal uh, properties. So this was how this compound was found. But soon after that, people found this compound has other nice properties. Yeah, that include, uh, it can suppress your immune system so that the transplantation can be uh, uh, less, you know, uh, immunogenic. And uh, I think some of you, or hopefully not, uh, some, some people actually uh, could suffer from cardiovascular disease and uh, some of them have to install a stent uh, in the blood vessel. And it's very common to use uh, this uh, drug, rapamycin, to coat it on the stent to pre prevent the immune response. And later on, people also found uh, this compound has an uh, anti-cancer property. Actually, it was uh, approved in 1999 by FDA that this drug can be used for uh, anti-cancer applications. And uh, so I mentioned already three properties, antifungal and uh, for uh, transplantation and also for anti-cancer 
And even more recently, around 2003, uh, people found out actually this compound can also have uh, uh, anti-aging uh, property. That means it can uh, help to uh, increase the longevity of uh, uh, life. And uh, uh, it has been found first in a, a, a warm system, which is called C. elegans. But later on, uh, this anti-aging property was also tested uh, in different kind of uh, uh, animal models as well. And uh, why are we interested in this subject? Uh, because we found um, there was uh, something not so well explained uh, for the drug resistance of this compound. As I mentioned, uh, this compound was approved around uh, 1999, okay? And uh, there's a very similar compound called Everolimus, which is uh, uh, slightly modified chemical molecules, uh, which is supposed to be uh, more soluble than rapamycin, but the difference is very tiny. Okay, you, you basically can consider the uh, molecular action is basically the same. So, um, and uh, similar to rapamycin, Ebrolimus is also uh, widely uh, prescribed uh, for different kinds of situation. And here, I show you an article published in uh, 2014, and you can see that uh, in this study, a patient with a metastatic anaplastic thyroid cancer was uh, treated uh, with uh, this drug, Everolimus, yeah, uh, analog of uh, rapamycin. But then, uh, in the beginning, it was very nice because uh, this uh, patient respond to this drug very well. And uh, uh, in, uh, for the first 18 months, it was a complete response and last for a very long time. But then, uh, unfortunately, uh, the resistance occur. And uh, this was a very rare case. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, so far, uh, we, we are not aware of another uh, drug resistance case for uh, this uh, uh, Ebrodimus. Um, but when we read this article, I mean, uh, my, my group and uh, my uh, colleagues, my collaborators uh, in France, actually he's uh, in Econo Eco Economa, uh, and uh, uh, he came to Taiwan, uh, I think uh, in the March of uh, 2019, and he visited our center and uh, uh, he found uh, I'm doing molecular time simulation, so maybe we can work on uh, some subject. And, uh, and when we sit together and try to read the literature, we found this is an unsolved problem so far. Uh, the, uh, uh, the people in this uh, uh, article, they found actually there's a mutant called F2108L. This means that the residue as the uh, 2108 position was changed from phenylalanine to leucine. If you, if you still remember what these two residues are, one is uh, phenylalanine, the other one leucine, both are hydrophobic residues and both are, both are quite bulky. And uh, for me, it's not obvious at all why this mutant can cause uh, this kind of uh, drug resistance. And this is uh, what they show in their paper, okay? They did not really try to de determine the structural mutant. The wild type, I mean the unmutated, they, they call non-mutant, uh, the structure has been determined for quite some time. It, you can easily find it from the protein data bank. And they try to say, okay, if you have a, a original phenylalanine at this position, 2108, when you change to leucine, there will be some steric effect to prevent the binding of the drug, like volumus or rapamycin here. And I think uh, even you, looking at this uh, uh, figure, it's very difficult to be convinced, right? And therefore we think there must be deeper reason 
and they don't really have a direct biochemical or structural study on this mutant structure. So I, I feel that um, uh, uh, it's necessary, yeah, to determine the structure first, so we can understand the true reason why this mutant uh, will cause the unbinding of the drug, lopamycin. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is try to set up a, a system to express a protein. The so-called express protein, it means that it's total growth protein, to grow protein. Uh, that's how, how we say that in biology. And uh, typical uh, uh, cell expression system is by E. coli. Okay, and this is uh, uh, the postdoc in my lab uh, doing all the experimental work. Uh, her name is uh, Su Yu Huang. And uh, usually you try to engineer different kind of plasmid so that you can generate different kind of protein in, inside the E. coli. Uh, the advantage of E. coli is that uh, it can uh, generate uh, protein rather quickly. And uh, uh, the the protocol has been established for uh, two or three decades. And therefore, you can, you can have uh, much better success rates. And my postdoc, Sui, uh, she has a lot of experiences in uh, expressing different kinds of proteins with E. coli. And therefore, uh, actually, I feel uh, her progress on this subject was quite relatively smooth. Yeah? She can get the protein she wants, and I never heard that she has some uh, major difficulties for that. And uh, you have to do some um, uh, gene engineering uh, to insert uh, the uh, exons that of the protein that you want to uh, generate into the system. Okay, and uh, to to be sure that uh, our technique uh, can really generate the protein uh, structures correctly, we do not only uh, try to determine the structure of uh, the F2108 mutant, we also uh, determine the structure of the wild type to make sure that actually we can reproduce the structure published in the literature as a kind of uh, a positive control. So here you can see um, the uh, figures for the uh, protein purification. And we can see that uh, for the band, actually at the location, we will see whether um, the desired protein was uh, expressed in a larger amount. Yeah, only in this case, you have some promise of uh, having uh, the, the, the structure to, de to be determined by NMR uh, methodology. And uh, this is the so-called HSQC spectra of NMR, which is, um, uh, I think whenever you open any NMR paper, you can see this kind of uh, spectra. And this spectra uh, can be considered as a fingerprint or signature of a certain protein. Yeah, And as I mentioned, that the uh, structure has been determined previously. Actually, the structure of uh, uh, um, this uh, rapamycin bound uh, mTOR structure has been determined several times by different groups. So um, for the wire type, you can actually find this kind of spectra in the literature. And so when we uh, express a protein, purified it, and finally put in the NMR machine, we actually can confirm that our HSQC spectra is the same as the one published in literature. And then secondly, we can check the HSQC spectra of the uh, mutant, F2108L mutant. And by looking at this HSQC spectra, we know how much are different, okay? And, uh, and by looking at the differences, we have uh, some idea uh, about the region of the, the protein which could have a structural alteration. Yeah, so this is uh, what we do typically. So the blue one is a Y-type HSQC uh, spectra for the 
uh, rapamycin binding domain of uh, mTOR. Yeah, we, we call it FRB. Yeah, this is the uh, rapamycin domain, uh, rapamycin binding domain of uh, FRB. And the red, red ones are the uh, 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 peaks for the uh, mutant. Yeah? So you can see uh, a lot of the peaks are actually overlapped with each other, but there are some uh, differences. Okay, so we can also check the so-called uh, chemical sheet uh, perturbation, the CSP, and to see the difference. So here you can see that uh, Sui uh, was able to identify this region was the, was the different, okay? But how different it is, uh, takes some more time yeah, to study. So the molecule graphics was made by the Y type structure. It doesn't mean the uh, uh, mutant really has the same structure, yeah, but uh, she tried to map, actually it was uh, around this region that we could have the structural differences. Okay, so uh, structural determination really takes some effort and uh, Sui joined our lab uh, in the beginning of uh, 2020, uh, 2020, I think, right before COVID-19 started. Okay, so uh, at that time, uh, we didn't really know. Uh, we, uh, we need to uh, spend so much effort to determine structure. And for myself, I benefit a lot from uh, working with her so that I know uh, uh, more details about the entire NMR uh, methodology for structural determination. And uh, actually I also, uh, uh, run some cases by myself uh, to see the procedures and also to know what kind of files will be required uh, to determine a uh, real NMR structure. Yeah, uh, yeah. usually for a protein structure like this, uh, after you have all the so-called assignments and o NOEs, uh, so it will take uh, something like uh, uh, 800 seconds. Yeah, something like 14 minutes with uh, my machine yeah, to get it. It could be faster if you have a faster machine. So um, uh, the structure determination uh, actually uh, is, can be considered quick as long as your assignment is correct. But then this is the question. This is the very question still a lot of uh, NMR people are suffering. Yeah, they are not quite uh, quite sure, and uh, uh, because of their uh, restraint, uh, each time they can have different structure determined, and uh, uh, the program actually will provide them some informations about the so-called Van der Waals uh, violation or uh, distance restraint violation and also some uh, uh, quality assessments for the structure. And they actually uh, have to follow this kind of uh, uh, evaluation and then try to improve their uh, structure based on uh, different kind of uh, assignments or NOE, uh, you know, uh, restraints, etc. So, sorry. Can you still hear me? Sorry. Can some people speak? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can hear you. So, so far you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. somehow I'm trying to play. Okay, yeah. I want to play this, uh, you know, the rotation of uh, this molecule, yeah. The, the tan color is the original uh, FRB structure. Uh, the PDBID is one FAP. Uh, show again. And uh, uh, the, the blue one is the structure uh, we just determined recently. Uh, I think since uh, something like one or two months ago, uh, the structure is uh, more or less converged, but Sui is still not fully satisfied. Uh, she's still struggling with the numbers and uh, she tried to improve that by, I can tell you basically uh, the structure is the same. 
and uh, basically, yeah, basically structure is the same. And therefore, uh, you can see that the major differences uh, between the mutant structure and the wild type structure is the kink at the helixes. There's a deviation here. Yeah, there's uh, some difference here. Yeah, and uh, uh, we feel that this uh, structural difference could be uh, responsible uh, for uh, the, uh, um, the unbinding of the drug rapamycin. Yeah, but how to answer this question? So we cannot, you know, simply stop here. Since we know it's a fact that rapamycin will not bind to the wild type, so you will never be able to determine the complex structure of a rapamycin with a with a mutant structure, yeah? Because this is a fact; they will not bind, and since they will not bind, you will not get this kind of complex structure. And uh, if you really want to understand why then you need to have a fair comparison. For example, you can try to simulate uh, the system of a rapamycin with FRB or even with FKPP and dopamycin. This system actually uh, is very interesting. The dopamycin actually binds to another protein first. This protein is called FKPP. And then altogether, rapamycin, FKPP, then bind to mTOR uh, to the region of the dopamycin binding a domain, FRB, yeah. So uh, we can actually uh, conduct molecular simulation to see whether we can understand the difference. I would say it's very important to understand the difference because uh, for this unfortunate patient, uh, she gave us a legacy that uh, we can know what should be the mutant causing the drug resistance. But uh, for the future, maybe we can have a better drug or different kind of drug that can also work for the mutant. Then in this case, uh, the patient will not suffer from the drug resistance issue. Uh, although now we are in the very beginning stage, but I think uh, uh, to determine the structure of the mutant is really a very important stage. But, and as I said, we even cannot stop here. Okay, so to understand the rest of the things, uh, we actually have to follow the dream of uh, Lou Fish Boltzmann, who is an uh, Austrian physicist, unfortunately passed away uh, at the age of 52 or three in uh, uh, 1906, yeah in an area very near to uh, Trieste. So he uh, almost single-handed create uh, statistical mechanics. Yeah, basically uh, he let us know uh, what should be the uh, population distribution for a so-called canonical ensemble and uh, how we can derive a different kind of uh, uh, thermodynamic quantities as long as we can write down the so-called partition function and uh, including uh, so-called free energies. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, I mean, in the end of uh, uh, 19th century or beginning of uh, 20th centuries, uh, we even don't know the structure of the molecules. Yeah, because don't forget, when do we have the X-ray? It was the first Nobel Prize, right? And therefore, before we have this kind of powerful uh, technique, we cannot uh, really determine the atomic structure correctly. And uh, one century has passed by. We now have uh, many tools. We know a lot of structures. Yeah, you, I just uh, showed you previously, you can use uh, NMR to determine uh, a protein structure, which was uh, unimaginable by uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. And uh, now we have a lot of uh, uh, simulation tools, and I will show you now uh, how we actually uh, are getting uh, closer to the dream of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann and how to derive different kind of uh, physical quantities uh, by by theoretical tools. Okay, so uh, I will start from uh, uh, this slide, which is telling you the. Uh, 
uh, mainstream uh, methods for uh, doing the molecular dyne simulations. Because uh, uh, as I mentioned previously, in uh, Boltzmann's time, actually our uh, understanding for the uh, molecular world is quite limited. So um, uh, they didn't really know uh, how to determine, uh, for example, the energies of the molecules uh, in different conformations and how they interact with each other. It took a long time for people to realize that we actually can have a scheme starting from quantum mechanics and we can determine uh, the, the energy of different structures and to learn from these very expensive calculations. And finally, we can determine a simplified model like this. So this is a, a very popular uh, program called AMBA. And this is the first fuel equation uh, they uh, released in 1994-95. Uh, um, basically, the first fuel equation they are using is not the first fuel equation they are using is not too different from uh, this one. So I think it's uh, still worthwhile to, uh, to learn it. First, you can imagine for all the molecules, as long as you have bounds, it, it could it should have an equilibrium uh, bound length. Yeah? Since it has an equilibrium bound length, all the bounds, all the instantaneous bounds are just perturbation to the equilibrium bounds. So this kind of scenario uh, is very similar to the button of uh, any, any function. And uh, you, you can see that with the Taylor expansion to the first order, or to, to, uh, you can say to the second order, um, uh, everything can be uh, expressed by this kind of quadratic uh, um, um, uh, quadratic function. Similarly, uh, for the angle, you also have an equilibrium angle. Yeah, bounds and angles are really rigid in the molecules. And therefore, for both uh, energy terms, you can describe them with this kind of uh, quadratic form. And then for the, for the torsion, yeah, the third one, yeah, you can imagine when you turn this bound for 330 degrees, then you are back. And quantum mechanics tells you that before and after you turn this bound for 360 degrees, this molecule is the same. From quantum mechanics of, uh, point of view, it's indistinguishable. Yeah, and therefore you should have a periodic function. And uh, one of the best approach to determine the uh, periodic function was by Fourier series expansion. And that's why you see these kind of cosine terms for this uh, so-called uh, dihedral energy. Yeah, actually people also call it torsion energy. And uh, that's uh, the torsion energy of the uh, given chemical bound. So the previous three turns are the so-called uh, bounded turns. And then uh, for uh, uh, molecule, uh, large molecules, actually two other uh, additional uh, interactions is also very important. The first one is a fundamental interaction. It's this kind of uh, Lena Jones form. I think it was uh, uh, proposed around 1930s by uh, Dr. Uh, Zhang, um, Zhang um, Lena Jones. Zhang Jones, okay. Uh, his wife was called uh, Catherine Leonard. So after ma marriage, uh, she put uh, his wife's name in front of, of his original name. So he become uh, Lena Jones because of his marriage. Yeah. And then this uh, uh, coral interaction. Yeah. Uh, I think you are already uh, familiar with the coral interaction, but then I will tell you some other things later. A trick, important trick in this uh, molecular mechanics field is that they try to use different kind of parameters for even the same element, but in different uh, molecules or a different position of the molecules. Yeah? And therefore we can say not all the carbons are the same. Yeah? Even if it's a carbon, the same element, but if it's different uh, position of the molecule, you should try to use different kind of uh, energy description for all the five terms I just mentioned. 
uh, for the same element. Yeah? And uh, they create a terminology called atom types. Different uh, programs, different package have their different ways of defining the atom types. I just mentioned the so-called Ember force field. This is one famous program. There are also other programs like CHARM, yeah, which is developed uh, in Harvard University. It's also quite famous. And there's also OPRS uh, force field developed by uh, Jorgensen Yingyao and uh, also other you know, force fields. And one of the first things that these people have to do to create their own you know, force field system is to define their atom types. Different people have their ways of looking at the molecules. Yeah, some people may think that, okay, these two uh, elements in these two uh, molecules should be similar. And therefore they think that they can be defined by one atom type, but different people can have different uh, ways of looking at the same molecules. And therefore the definitions could differ uh, from force field to uh, force field. Um, so basically the atom types is the building blocks for this kind of force field uh, based on molecule modeling. So here I give you some example. The same carbon, but uh, if it's in the sp3 structure, then you call it CT. And for carbonyl sp2, then you call it C. Yeah? If it's a uh, aromatic sp2 carbon, and for example, also the uh, uh, C epsilon of uh, arginine, then it's called CA. So uh, by looking at the description, you know uh, how your uh, carbon should be assigned for atom type, okay? So this is uh, uh, a very useful table. Uh, and of course, uh, to really know how to uh, make this kind of atom type assignment, uh, you should really have a good uh, chemistry or chemical intuitions. And this is an example for the nitrogen and for the oxygen, sulfur, uh, phosphorus, uh, things like that. And uh, you see even for hydrogen, you could could have uh, 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 many different kinds of hydrogen uh, according to its position in different kinds of molecules. Okay, so this is um, uh, a view uh, of uh, amino acids uh, in terms of atom types. So here you can see that all the atoms here are described by atom types. The CTC are not the elements, these are the atom types. And then you may see also some uh, small fractional numbers, yeah, 0.2719. Yeah, these are the so-called partial charges, which are used to determine the, the Coulomb interactions, the QIQZ over R, this term, the last term I mentioned in the amber force field. And again, you can, you can see uh, other uh, amino acids. And here I want to point out uh, in amber, they want to make you uh, very well aware that different kind of uh, protonation should even be uh, named differently. Yeah, if you look at the protein data bank, all these three actually are called the same. They are the so-called histidine, and the symbol for this residue is HIS. But in amber. This one is called HID, and this one HIE, and this one HIP, because their protonation are different. For this one, it's uh, um, the so-called uh, delta nitrogen position is protonated. And for this one, it's uh, ischium position nitrogen. This is the ischium position nitrogen was protonated. And for this one, both uh, Delta position nitrogen and ischium position nitrogen are protonated and it's called HIP, okay? So uh, for Ember, they want to make it very clear that any difference in the atom composition of a chemical moiety should be called differently. So there will be no confusion. And here is another example. You can see CYS and CYX in PDB in protein data bank, you can only see CYS. But this CYX means that it doesn't have the 
uh, hydrogen attached to sulfur. And this kind of system actually will allow the so-called disulfide bond. With the disulfide bond, this uh, protein molecule will be more stable, yeah? And uh, which is uh, sometimes very important to have uh, its uh, uh, functions. Okay, so here are just other examples. Uh, I don't have uh, some uh, special things to mention. So here I want to let you see how the bound parameters look like. Okay, they mentioned for this kind of bound, two atom types, C and C, and another two atom types, C and A, and then this will be uh, the uh, the spring constant, and this will be the equilibrium bound length. Okay, and angle. Yeah, three atoms define the angle. Yeah, this is the atom in the center. So uh, one will be uh, the uh, the spring constant for the angle, and the other one will be the equilibrium angle uh, for this bound. Uh, for this, uh, yes, uh, for this uh, uh, three three atom. And for the torsion parameters, it could be more complicated because uh, it's a Fourier series. So usually you need to have uh, more than one uh, uh, parameters to describe uh, a torsion. Okay, and this is fundal interactions, uh, fundal parameters. And uh, you remember in the equation, there's a, a, a over R12, and the other one is a B over R to the a six. So these are the uh, parameters to define the so-called fundal uh, interactions. Okay. So I said that actually uh, it's not highly non-trivial to determine the partial charges. Uh, and therefore here, uh, uh, I want to show you uh, the method, uh, at, at least in the Amber uh, methodology to determine the partial charges. It's an important question. And therefore many different people have tried to improve the so-called uh, uh, partial charge determination. And so you see, this is a paper by Peter Goldman in uh, 1984. Um, but you see that after many years of experience, I think more than one decade, and finally he came up with a, a good idea, published in uh, 1993. And this method for partial charge determination is called RESP model. And the charge are called the RESP charges. So basically, it's a two-stage uh, retrain approach uh, to fit the electrostatic potential. And then uh, by doing that, you use, uh, you try to determine the charge of these uh, represented uh, 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 partial charges uh, for, for the molecules. This is the retrain function used uh, in the RESP method. So as I mentioned, this was published in uh, uh, 1993 and in the same year, uh, they applied it to uh, many different kinds of uh, molecules and they found indeed uh, the new charge model uh, uh, lead to much better agreement with the known uh, literature. And uh, another uh, similar validation paper. And in this article, they tested for uh, many, many more uh, molecules to show that actually, uh, indeed, uh, this uh, new charge model, the so-called rest for charge model, was indeed very good. Okay. The uh, uh, advantage, disadvantage of this uh, rest for charge model is that it required a relatively expensive common chemical calculations. And therefore, the first author when he uh, returned to Canada, uh, Christopher Bailey, uh, he tried to uh, uh, create another model, uh, which he hoped to uh, be of a similar accuracy of the rest per charges, but could be much cheaper. And this model is called N1BCC. It does not really require on the uh, artificial calculation like uh, how to for it. Uh, calculations, but it's uh, only using some uh, semi-empirical calculation. Some of you are familiar with the semi-empirical calculation. When you see N1, you know what I mean. Yeah, Austin model one, yeah. And you use the so-called bound charge correction uh, to improve uh, 
uh, the charge derived by the so-called M1 method and to make his M1 BCC model. So these are some uh, uh, screenshots from his paper uh, to show actually uh, the so-called M1 BCC charge model can uh, re uh, reproduce really well the risk per charges. And this is another uh, paper showing how uh, they did a uh, parameterization and you see that uh, they tested for more than 2,700 molecules and they really show that the uh, N1B charge are very similar uh, to the risk per charges. So uh, actually in my group, uh, when I need to do a so-called virtual screening, uh, I use uh, N1B charges because this is the only practical approach we can do. Yeah, if you want to make a virtual screening of uh, something like uh, one million uh, compounds as the library that you want to screen, uh, I think uh, we really cannot afford to, to use uh, uh, hard fault calculation um, uh, to do all of them. Okay, so there's another field which was not really de derived from quantum chemical calculation, which is the water models. Somehow it's uh, uh, notoriously difficult that uh, it's almost impossible to derive the water model from quantum chemical ca calculations. And therefore all the current water models was derived by empirical approach. Okay, but uh, the good thing is uh, water can be described by relatively simple models and you can reproduce a lot of uh, known physical properties. For example, uh, I think I stick some of the slides uh, to show you, but uh, yeah, I, I think uh, the message is, uh, is very clear. Uh, for water model, although you cannot derive with a common chemical approach, uh, you really can reproduce this uh, result. Uh, with a uh, X-ray and the neutron scattering data. So people are also uh, interested in knowing uh, how good are these uh, fossil fuels, how good are amber fossil fuels, how good are charm fossil fuels, all these fossil fuels. And therefore, uh, uh, people try to compare with the uh, experiments. And one of the most uh, authoritative uh, comparison is to compare with the animal experiments. And this is a paper published in 2012, uh, done by uh, the group in uh, Stanford, uh, with the Pandey's group. And uh, the conclusion was uh, by using the uh, uh, amber force fields, uh, you can very nicely reproduce uh, the animal uh, properties like uh, chemical shifts and J coupling and also uh, realization uh, experiments. Okay, so when we um, uh, have the PDB file, you have to do some processing. Yeah, some of the issue I mentioned previously, so I don't stop here. Uh, just that you know, actually, uh, even when the structure has been determined and deposited on the PDB, uh, and if you want to do something else, you have to pre-process uh, pre them. Uh, and uh, if you have some new molecules uh, for Ember, uh, it has some uh, software to help you to determine the first few parameters. And this is the so-called anti-chamber program. And uh, usually it depends on the uh, computation cost you want to uh, afford. Uh, you will decide whether you want to use uh, explicit solvent or implicit solvent simulations. I would say historically, uh, in explicit solvent simulations uh, became more mature uh, earlier than the uh, implicit solvent simulations. Yeah, and therefore I would say if you are not very familiar whether you should use explicit solvent and implicit solvent, uh, I think. Uh, I will recommend you to uh, use the explicit solvent first so that you can have a better understanding for the system. Yeah. And uh, usually for myself, I do uh, implicit solvent simulation only for uh, very particular situations. And uh, one uh, popular implicit solvent simulation was uh, the so-called Poisson-Boltzmann theory. Uh, I will not spend time here. 
And another one, uh, which is uh, very popular recently, uh, the so-called GB or generalized born, uh, uh, it's also very popular because its computational cost is even smaller than the uh, uh, Poisson-Boltzmann uh, uh, calculations. When you use the so-called explicit solvent simulations, then you have to use a periodic bound condition yeah, for obvious reason. Uh, otherwise, you are simulating just a cube of water. You are not simulating a, a large system. Yeah, we, we try to use this kind of uh, nearly infinite a system to mimic a large system. And uh, the so-called periodic bound condition uh, uh, was introduced. And uh, um, we know that uh, molecular dynamic simulation start with the so-called uh, solving the uh, Newtonian equation of motion. But actually, in the original uh, Newtonian equation of motion, you don't have the concept of the temperature. And uh, the concept of temperature was uh, introduced in this so-called Langevin dynamics. And uh, the temperature was introduced by uh, the random collision of the solvent molecule to the solute, like the biomolecules. And then also the dissipation of the uh, uh, energy, yeah, uh, to give you a kind of balance, yeah. And the the random uh, collision of the summer molecule uh, is a so-called fluctuation part, and uh, the dissipation uh, and the fluctuation, the collision, actually keep the input and output of the energy become uh, the same. And therefore, your system can be sustained at a fixed the desired temperature. So actually, it's a control by this kind of uh, a balance, or you can say this uh, fluctuation dissipation theory. And uh, uh, Berenson tried to de uh, derive a simpler uh, way of uh, controlling the temperature. And it's very popular. It's called uh, weak coupling thermostat. And uh, uh, in, if, if you look at his paper, then uh, you can find uh, how he show uh, this uh, so-called weak coupling thermostat uh, is somehow uh, derived from the so-called Langevin dynamics. And uh, when you have the system and the initial uh, size or the box of the system was not really correct, you may want to use the so-called constant pressure simulation to gradually change the box size of your system so that finally you can have a correct box size. So doing that actually for every uh, instance of your you know, configuration, you have to calculate the instantaneous pressure tensor. And by com comparing the instantaneous pressure to the uh, uh, reference uh, pressure, then gradually you make the two things uh, close to each other. And uh, in the isotropic system like a protein in the water, you could use the so-called isotropic pressure regulation. But if you have a protein in a membrane because the system was anisotropic, then you should use the so-called anisotropic scaling. The way we try to uh, uh, evolve the system uh, by solving the so-called um, uh, Newtonian equation was the, uh, by using this kind of, for example, uh, philip Liefra algorithm. And by choosing should be small time step, uh, like uh, this right hand one, then you can uh, 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 generate the new conformations or new uh, configuration of snapshots of your MD system uh, really efficiently. So uh, usually in the biomolecule simulations, the time step uh, is around one or two femtoseconds. And uh, so far, the longest simulation is around a uh, millisecond time scale. And the system uh, was uh, quite small uh, for, for this kind of long time simulations. I think a lot of people now is at a, a microsecond time scale, including us. Yeah. But still, this time scale, I would say, is already uh, able to do a lot of things. So how to treat a long range interaction in the periodic bound condition? 
actually there's a conditional convergence problem here. Yeah. And uh, 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 physicist called Paul uh, Peter Evart, he nicely solved this problem in 1921. Uh, but this paper was not so much uh, noticed uh, on, until now, we've uh, until relatively recently, we are able to do large scale uh, simulations. And uh, basically, you try to split the clone interaction into uh, a short range part by introduce uh, using a function, and then the rest of it actually uh, you try to uh, choose the this uh, file R so that in the Fourier space it's also short ranged. And this is the final uh, formula for the so-called EVA sum. Uh, in its uh, uh, original form, actually, it's an uh, n-square algorithm. And therefore, it's still, it's, it's still not so suitable for large-scale uh, simulations. In 1993, uh, Tom Darden and his colleague, uh, Lee Peter Patterson, et cetera, they, they improved the uh, original EVA uh, for, uh, sums uh, by introducing the uh, fast Fourier transform so that the method become n log n methods. And uh, uh, I think since that time, uh, this method uh, become uh, the standard approach for molecular dynamization. Because the computational cost of this particle mesh EVA is almost the same as the, the one you use for the cutoff method. Uh, but color method give you, you know, disaster in your simulation. So basically, uh, I would say since 1993 or 95, you really don't have the reason to use the wrong cutoff approach. And now with uh, uh, ever in, uh, improving, you know, parameterization of the force field and uh, different tests in many different kind of systems, now we really have a, a much better uh, chance of uh, having a success simulation. And this is one of the early examples that show you that uh, they were able to simulate, to successfully predict the, the structure of a design protein um, uh, uh, made around that time. So you can see that here actually are two structures, one from simulation, the other from, from the NMR experiments. And uh, I want to uh, show you um, animation. Georgina, so this is the you... final protein structure. No, so, sorry to interrupt, but uh, uh, the time runs fast. So, Okay. How much time do I have? Um, theory one minute. Okay, well, okay. We started a little later, so let's say maximum five minutes uh, with the questions. So okay, have to be tight. So yeah. So I just uh, I think I, I I'm almost uh, I could use the uh, five minutes yeah uh, to uh, yeah, finish uh, the rest of the talk. Okay. So these are more examples you can successfully fold the protein. And uh, I, I can skip some of the theoretical parts, what the so-called free energy is. These are uh, you, what you can find in the, in the textbook. But I, can, I have to tell you, uh, you don't find it in all the textbooks. Some textbooks give you the so-called standard free energy binding, some not. Yeah, I'm a professor for physical chemistry. I, I found this a very interesting phenomena. Uh, okay, anyway, I try to provide that. And this is the experimental approach to determine the binding thermodynamics. And uh, another approach to get the so-called binding constant KD is by using this uh, SPR experiment. And uh, uh, this was, so I'm going to talk about so-called potential mean force, which was uh, established in 1935. Uh, and then uh, in 1954, uh, uh, Robert Fancich um, pushed before word. Basically, they make a connection between the radio distribution function and Helmholtz free energy, like uh, this formula. 
And they say that by using the so-called unbiased sampling, you can try to uh, get a correct uh, uh, radio diffusion function uh, by uh, applying some unbiased potential. And in 1977, by Tori and Valo, uh, they uh, proposed the so-called unbiased sampling technique. Uh, although it was uh, formulated in 1970s, by, uh, by molecule simulation was uh, not so much applied because of the computational cost. Even in the time of uh, 2000, 2002, or 2005, people still cannot run long time simulation. They are stuck with the nanosecond simulation, et cetera. And therefore, this kind of form is actually uh, only remain in a uh, very simple system, simple fluids. And uh, for some system, they even know how to uh, do unbiasing. This is uh, 1992, and the so-called weighty ensemble, uh, weighty histogram analysis method by using a kind of iteration approach to determine uh, the, the, the constants uh, for these uh, umbrella samplings. There's another technique called so dynamic integration uh, that allows you uh, to get to get an explicit formula to unbiased uh, the unbiased sampling. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not so many people have tried to apply that. And therefore, when the first people try to apply the unbiased sampling technique for uh, biomolecule systems, they use a relative uh, intuitive approach, or you can say naive approach. Okay, for example, if you have two molecules, uh, you want to pull them away. They first define the vector, and then along this vector, step by step, apply their biasing potential. That's what people do, okay? And uh, in 2003, one of my colleagues in UCSD, Richard Henchman, now in uh, Manchester, he did something interesting. What if you change the vector direction? Could you get the same uh, potential mean force? The answer was no, okay? But uh, I found not so many people really follow uh, his uh, warning at that time. So actually, we feel this is a very clear sign that we should not use this kind of vectorial approach. And uh, we simply allow the protein to uh, spontaneously dissociate, uh, taking a, a covilinear path. And each time we'll have a different kind of potential mean force. And then we use a variational principle to take the lower bound. The reason why we, we adopt this variation principle is because all these higher uh, dissipate energy come from dissipation. They are excess, excessive dissipations. And therefore, uh, we should take the lower bound instead of the other in intermediate uh, potential mean forces. And this is the formula we try to derive from statistical mechanics. Uh, the derivation, uh, please uh, look at our paper published in 2019. And as you can see from this figure, yeah, each time you actually have a covilinear dissociation pathways. And interestingly, we found that uh, in 2017, there was a very similar attempt uh, for the same system, uh, the protein is called Barnes and Barstar. And, uh, they have the uh, conclusion that the dissociation of these two proteins actually follow two major, two major pathways. And we have the same conclusion with our approach. Yeah. And therefore, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, our approach will take only 1,000 less time yeah, uh, to do the, the simulations. And actually, recently, we also applied this kind of simulation, uh, try to find uh, the peptide drug that can uh, block the human AC2 receptor. And this is a spike protein of the COVID-19. Uh, you know that uh, 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 Trump got infected uh, last year, but then he was treated with a regeneron. So we, gen we basically can also try to um, uh, make some mutations on the regional to make it even more effective than it is. Yeah, for the FKBP robomycin 
uh, uh, FRP system, we did something very similar to the protein I just introduced to you. So here we have a FKBB protein, rapamycin, and on the right is the FRB. FRB is the region of the protein which had a mutant I just mentioned. And uh, with this kind of covilinear path umbrella sampling simulation technique, we can simulate the dissociation of the FKBP with a rapamycin. We can find that our uh, simulation nicely reproduce the experimental results. And for the mutant, which just, uh, was found to have a low, smaller binding free energy, our simulation umbrella sampling simulation also can reproduce this uh, reduced uh, free energy binding. Yeah. So, uh, we actually still uh, miss the last part of the story. Yeah, we are we are trying to see whether uh, by using the mutant structure that Suyu determined, we'll be able to answer why rapamycin will not bind. Yeah, we 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 have also done this kind of uh, uh, dissociation simulation. We show actu actually uh, the binding free energy will be significantly reduced. But we feel this is not enough. So we are going to do the spontaneous association of the rapamycin to FRB and also its uh, uh, mutant uh, to see whether we can uh, uh, have uh, another aspect of uh, this uh, process. So uh, this is my current group. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I had a question. Um... Actually, uh, you know, when, uh, when we work on uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, I mean, we get data from nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, we try to, to realize uh, the, the, the protein, so to find the 3D conformation of the protein. Uh, generally, okay, we work mainly on the distances. We have some distances that are derived from the chemical structure of the molecule, uh, atom bonds, uh, atom angles, um, bond angles, ang uh, angles, yes, and uh, plus the NMR, the distances that are derived from NMR. But in your talk, you talked about the detail that we never considered so far uh, in our um, simulations, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the atomic charge, the electric charge of the atom. Do you think uh, we should uh, add in our uh, computations this information in order to get you know to get the better uh, uh, results. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I was uh, uh, trying to say uh, yes. Of course, uh, these charges will affect the the you know the structure. Yeah, but um, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned also uh, actually people also try to ex uh, include the explicit solvent to refine the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in principle, it should be possible if you start from a approximate structure and then you use simply molecular dyne simulation, you can reach an improved model. That ah, should okay. be possible. Pretty, pretty okay. much like uh, you know uh, the protein folding simulation I just showed. Mm -hmm. You know, that was even more challenging. You start from a wrong structure, yeah? What you have is just the amino acid sequence of your protein, yeah? But then because of the, uh, you know, physical nature of the protein, uh, and, uh, you know, we assume that uh, if there's only one um, optimal structure in nature, then it should be able to find it because this is the, you know, physiochemical principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, the cost is uh, you have to run um, quite a long simulation. Um, but yeah, but the, the, the thing is, as long as uh, your protein is not too big, now we are able to afford this kind of calculation. Yeah? I see. So, uh, but, yeah. For example, yeah. for the proteins, for the small proteins that we show in our Leipzig uh, proceedings, these yeah. are already doable for up initial folding simulations. Yeah, okay. You I can see. even yeah. double the size. 
-hmm. You can even double size. That's also possible. Yeah. But uh, you are still seeing this, I mean, the use of this information about electric charge as a post-processing, not, uh, not uh, something to consider during the, the, the construction of the, of the conformation. Do you think it's, it's, it would be useful to consider this electric charge from the very beginning, when we start to build the molecule in, the, on the, in silico, I mean? On the well, I think it's solution. possible. And I think uh, in the uh, NMR structure determination, they have that already. 